Uh, my name is Dimitri Ponirakis. I'm Senior Noise Analyst at the Center for Conservation Bioacoustics at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, we have a mission, and our mission is to uh, collect and interpret sounds in nature by developing and applying innovative conservation technologies across multiple ecological scales to inspire and inform conservation of wildlife and habitats. Um, who are we? We are a highly indis dis interdisciplinary team of 30 scientists, engineers, educators, postdocs, students, and research personnel. Um, we are species agnostic. We study most species, uh, different uh, taxa, um, both in the marine environment and the terrestrial environment, vertebrate and invertebrate. Um, we love technology and what it can do for conservation. Um, so why passive acoustic monitoring? Um, basically, acoustic monitoring can allow you to boldly go to places where you might otherwise be unable to go, um, such as in deep forests, as was mentioned, or under the ocean. Um, and you can answer key questions as to what's out there, where is it, when is it, and how is, how is it um, uh, being used. How many vocalizations are there? Um, there are many types, different types of passive acoustics. Um, some units are stationary. Um, um, some units are stationary. Um, some are mobile. So you, you see on the left, you, like what we've been hearing, you've got you've, um, recording units that are like, can be att attached to a tree, and they can stay there for months at a time, recording continuously at whatever's around them. Um, similarly, you can have, do the same thing in the ocean. You can have an underwater recording unit at, um, anchored to the seabed uh, with a hydrophone listening for perhaps even up to a year, uh, recording what's around it. Um, you can have mobile units. So on the right, you have something called a glider here, which is um, it's kind of like a torpedo that um, moves around the ocean in transects, and it's recording both temporarily and spatially, so it's recording over space and time. Um, you have a combination of, you can have archival units, um, so they're units that basically put out them, put them out, you leave them out there, and um, they record for months, and then somebody comes and picks them up, and then takes the, the, the sound from those, uh, abstracts the files from those, and does the analysis. You can also have real-time monitors, such on the, uh, you can see on the right here, there's a thing called an auto buoy. Um, so that ha um, has a radio link to, to a base station and, and it's detecting, it could detect uh, vocalizations in real time. And so depending on what it's being used for, perhaps for detecting endangered whale species or something like that, um, for collision with shipping, um, um, it has a, a sort of real, real-time conservation uses. You can have single sensors and an array of sensors. Um, if, if you might just want a single sensor if you're just in, interested in a particular area over, over a period of time and you want to know what's going on there. Or you can have an array of sensors to cover larger, larger areas. Um, also, if you, have, uh, if you have the sensors close enough, at least three of them, then you can start to localize vocalizations across those three sensors choose um, time of arrival me measurements or other methods. Um, and if you're measuring those vocalizations, uh, local, uh, localizations over time, you can track them. So you can track um, a, 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 an animal that's calling you know, continuously, perhaps. You can, you can start to track where they're moving. Um, uh, one of the issues is that you know you're, you're generating large data as already been mentioned. So if you have a terrestrial unit that's running at 48 kilohertz at 16-bit resolution, you generate about eight gigabytes of data per day. And in the marine environment, you might have higher sample rates, something like 200 kilohertz. Um, recording at 24 bits, that's 50 gigabytes per channel per day. Um, so to do to do the measurements, you need sensors, and we have a we we'll have our own in-house sensors. Um, we have, for the marine environment, we have a, something called a rock hopper. Um, it's for deployment in the oceans, um, and it's uh, capable to use up to the depth of about 3,500 meters. 
It's a 24-bit resolution, and it can sample up to 394 kilohertz. Um, it can record for six months continuous at a continuous sampling rate um, uh, at 197 kilohertz at 24-bit resolution. It stores data on flag files, which is a lossless compression file um, on two four terabyte solid state drives. We also have our own Swift uh, terrestrial recording units, um, similar to what we've seen bef just before. Um, and they are 16-bit resolution. They record, can record the sampling rates up to 96 kilohertz. Um, you can record those for, um, for 23 days, roughly. Continuous sampling rate at 48 kilohertz, 16-bit. Um, they save sound, uh, wave format sound files on an SD card. Um, this is a map of um, our current deployments that we have as of January 2020 in both the marine, which are in yellow, and, and the terrestrial in orange across the globe. And the issue is that <coughs> you're generating, as was mentioned, many of hundreds of terabytes and even up and now petabytes of data. So that creates a, a challenge for how do you analyze that mountain of data? So you need soft, basically, to handle the data and extract the information. And then once you have the information, how do you translate it into conservation actions? Especially, you can use software. Um, so it will, again, we're developing software in-house for that analysis and visualization. We have something called uh, Raven, which is a Java-based uh, system um, for acquisition, uh, visualization, and measurement of uh, an analysis of sounds. Um, it is uh, user-friendly uh, as a teaching tool, uh, as well as for scientists, scientific investigation. And we also have workshops that we hold multiple times a year for if people, to train people on how to use it. And we also have um, uh, video training that's available online if you check our website. Um, it, um, you, you, you can do measurements like, as we mentioned, you can do spectrograms or, um, you, as you can see in the bottom, or time series analysis, uh, our amplitude measurements, um, spectral analysis. You can make selections and store those selections and save them in files. And there's also um, detectors that you can run, such as um, band energy detectors, which you can run across your data. Um, you also have um, something called Raven X, which is a uh, MATLAB toolbox, which we use for rapid prototyping and algorithm de development. Um, it um, leverages high performance computing, so sort of distributed um, processing and um, parallel processing. And a lot of the software can be so also, I, um, I guess, in the future mounted up to something like Amazon Web Services, so you can. Uh, host, you can process the data in the cloud. Um, so what you can see here is a tool that takes the sound data and then turns it into sound level measurements. Um, is a, these panels are showing a, a period of data. So there's a spectrogram at the top. Um, this is underwater, so you've got shipping events. Um, and you've got third octave band data here, similarly. And then you have can band level measurements. So you can pick a band that you're interested in and create band levels. Then you have here the, um, spectral probability density um, distribution for that time period. And the tool can basically go at different scales from anything up to seconds, up to a whole years of data. It's able to process at different scales. And then that is kind of a level one data. And then you can take that level data and then you can use that for other analysis. And so this, this um, GUI that you can see in, in user interface, you can see in the one below is Taking that data, and it's also applying modeling. And this is a, a, a map of a noise field in Massachusetts Bay. And this is a shipping lane basically going into Boston Harbor. And you're able to map the uh, noise from the shipping and vocalizations from, in this case, northern right whales, a highly endangered species. And look at the impact on how their ability to communicate across space, because um, for right whales, that's their primary mode of communication. So then you can start to, uh, to model and do research on how, how noise is affecting the uh, species' ability to communicate. Um, this is a bit like David's thing, so I'm kind of repeating here, but this is, again, this is like a deal plot um, for a year's worth of data at Sapsucker Woods, um, where we are. Um, it's a, 
it's a cabled microphone and it's been recording continuously. Um, so this is a basically a noise level measurement. So it's not um, it's not a sound ecology. So it's measuring just the absolute levels. Um, so blue is low low intensity and red's high intensity. Again, you've got sunrise and sunset. And again, you can start to see things like frog chorusing at sunset, um, springtime bird song. Um, you can also see anthropogenic noise. So you have these vertical bands. And what this, these bands are is basically the difference between weekday and weekend traffic from the local roads, so commuting noise versus less commuting, I guess. And then the vertical da line down here is actually, again, it's an airport and there's a six o'clock flight, so you can actually see sort of the footprint of man, man on this uh, <coughs> deal plot. Um, this is WellNet, so here we start to use um, deep learning and machine learning to um, detect uh, vocalizations. Again, this is the northern right whale, it's a critically endangered species that um, migrates up and down the coast of the United States and Canada. Um, again, this is the shipping lane in Boston, and what we have here is um, 10 auto buoys, which you can see on the right, um, which are recording on the hydrophone, uh, you can see down here, um, and it's they de these are detecting in real time any vocalizations that a right whale will make in that area, and they're basically, each one is able to detect a, a, a sort of has a detection radius of roughly what you can see in that circle. Um, and so it, it takes those detections and in real time, it'll if there are detections, it'll broadcast those um, detections back to a base station and then those, base, those detections then will be posted to this website. Um, so any shipping that's traveling to the Boston shipping lanes will be able to, to visualize this, um, these detections in real time. And so they, can, they know that they have to slow down, <coughs> which reduces the um, probability of a fatality from ship strikes. And so this is like an example of a real world conservation um, tool that's working in real time using acoustic monitoring. We also have something called, we're developing something called uh, Bird, BirdNet in co collaboration with Google and the Chemnitz University of Technology. Um, currently there's a, a thousand species that have been um, uh, so, uh, built, use, uh, sort of built into the neural networks. Um, and again, they can detect in real time if you have a, a cabled microphone, such as we have here at the lab. Um, this is an example you can see, um, it's basically that you can see which ones it's detecting uh, tufted titmouse and then blue jays in real time. Um, the bar, or the blue bar gives you the confidence level of those, of what it thinks, so the higher that Further along the blue bar is the more confident it is that that's the, the vocalization signal that you're looking at. Um, it's also um, the actual the, the actual net itself is multimodal, and you can act, there's actually apps that you can use. Um, so we have an app called BirdNet, which is um, available on the Android phone. So if you go to Android, uh, the Android um, app store, you can actually download BirdNet and use it on your phone. So if you're going out in the woods or if you're um, hiking somewhere, you can actually use the, the tool to um, find out what birds you're hearing. And then that data, it, as, as it's useful for you, but it's also that data also goes up to the cloud and then is sort of crowdsourced and is, is available for use for scientific research. And in the background, you can see a map of one day's worth of detections um, across the whole of North America and the whole of Europe. And it's actually being scaled up to go global. So we, um, we, we're, we're taking data sets from uh, the Macaulay Library of Natural Sounds and, and Zeno Canto, uh, amongst other organizations, and using those as training sets. Um, and once you have that data set that you've crowdsourced, you can start to answer more conservation questions such as movement ecology. In this case, we're looking at sort of a movement ecology of a common nightingale in Europe um, over a period of a few months from April 2019 to July 2019. So you can see how it's sort of um, moving across Europe uh, um, over that time period. You can also kind of zoom in and look at biodiversity mo monitoring. 
Um, these blue dots are an array of 40 swift recording units that we have in Sapsucker Woods, which is um, the woodland outside of our, our lab. Um, and so you can see example of four different species and you can um, the heat maps of where, where those vocalizations are happening over a particular period of time. And then you can take the sort of features that um, the neural nets are picking up on and you can potentially use those to answer behavioral and evolutionary biological questions. Um, there are issues though, that, um, one of them is especially like in when you've got the dawn chorus, there's overlapping vocalizations and the, um, the neural nets have a, very, uh, have a hard time basically sort of differentiating or picking out a particular species when there's, there's overlapping calls. Um, so that's a, a challenge for the future is to, uh, how we can sort of deal with that issue. Uh, one of the solutions might be to use a, uh, what do you call these, um, a surround sound microphone um, with multiple microphones to, to maybe um, differentiate the sound across those, un uh, using directionality maybe to, to discern the different calls when they're overlapping. Um, we're going to have, apparently we're going to have a Kaggle contest, so if anybody's um, interested in answering this challenge, I'd, uh, I guess check our website, it's pro it should be, um, should be coming soon at some point. Um, and then finally, I just kind of wanted to outline some of the issues, challenges and opportunities. Uh, as we all know, it's a big data challenge. We're generating terabytes and petabytes of data. We need high performance computing solutions to deal with that. Um, and other issues like vocalizations. If you have a unit you, and you're trying to find an animal, you, you, you want to know how, many, how far that the, the unit can hear, basically. And to do that, you basically need to know the source level of, of the animals that are vocalizing of, of the species that you're interested in um, to be able to predict how far out the, the, the recording unit can hear. And that's important for the density estimation or population estimation and also for um, designing your deployments, basically. If you have an array, you want to know how far, away, how far to space them if you want to do localizations, you want to make sure that you have at least three units able to pick up a, a particular call, so they have to be dense enough that you're able to localize. Um, another important factor is we need to have good propagation modeling software for the same reasons. There are, there are software out there, but some of them are kind of challenging for people who are inexperienced or are not um, as well versed in that sort of acoustics, and so we need to sort of develop those propagation models and we do need, we need to develop methodologies, especially in the terrestrial uh, environment for capturing source levels of all the different species that we're interested in. We also need, as was mentioned, we need a, a lot of tra data for training sets. So we need, I, I guess, uh, to, as a shout out to everybody, is to, we need to be able to share what we've got so that we can improve those training models. Um, as was mentioned before, you know, after an event like the Australian fires, it's, it's, you put units out afterwards, it's, it's not as useful as, you, as if you didn't have, as you had units there before, so we need kind of a longitudinal um, recording you, um, uh, sensors, basically like what you, what you had in Australia there. Um, we need standardization. If we're all going to share our data, we need to agree measurement methods and we need agreed units that we're going to share our data with and we need common file naming structures so when we share our data we all know what we're looking at and we also when you're having recording units you want to be able to um, to characterize the units um, and calibrate them so that we know what the on absolute level what those those noise levels are and for sharing we need the common platforms that are findable accessible interoperable, reusable, uh, we need to leverage citizen science, we need to leverage crowdsourcing and we need to share with each other on various platforms. I didn't mention Wild Labs, but obviously Wild Labs is a big one. Um, so that's what I've got to say, and thanks for listening. And here's, here's a link to some of those um, websites that I mentioned, um, if you're interested. Thanks. Oh, wonderful, Dimitri. Thank you so much. Um, I think <laughs> we're going to ask all of our speakers to finish on a slide like that. It, could you go back one? If we yeah. can drop them those link it, links in. 
Yeah. I mean, you've basically captured the fundamental questions that were coming through when we we're um, uh, when we were uh, asking people why they were joining this. Isla, do you have a? Sorry, Isla distracted me. Isla, do you have a microphone? Do you want to jump in? Because I know you asked that earlier. Uh, no, okay. Uh, I was asking um, why there don't seem to be many audiograms for a different species to understand the range at which they hear sound. Um, do you know any co comprehensive sources for mammals? And uh, for my benefit, can you, uh, can you answer w what that means as well? Can you give um, a bit of context? Can you repeat? Uh, well, um, the, w with source levels, and especially in the terrestrial environment, it's, it's hard to capture a source level because ideally you have to get very close to the bird. Or, or other animal to be able to capture. Uh, and it, there's, a, there's other issues like directionality. Um, a lot of species, are, when they make a vocalization, it, it's not omnidirectional. That is, the sound isn't the same level coming out of different directions. So ideally, you want to measure the directionality of the vocalization as well. But there's, there's just the sheer number of species and the relative number that have actually been measured, their source levels have been measured is actually um, quite, quite few. So that's kind of a, a challenge for the future is to be able to, I mean, it's a challenge for, for all of us to go out and measure, measure those source levels to, to at least have some idea of, of the range that you're listening to, basically. You know, because if you have a recording unit, if you don't know what the source levels are, are you, you, and you're trying to pre a predictively model how many, how many individuals there are, you, you can't really do that unless you're able to know how, f how far that unit can listen, basically. Ayla, did that answer your question? Right. Not quite. Oh. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, you can you repeat much. the question again then? So. So no, she's asking why there don't seem to be many audiograms for different species to understand the range at which they can hear sound. Do you know oh, any? which they can hear sound. Oh, it's the other way around, right. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're looking at, I mean, in the marine environment, it's challenging because if you have like something like a blue whale, you can't really <laughs> test it. I mean, there's some, some species, it's just, it's hard to test them. You have to capture them. Um, you might have to, I mean, if you do like a, a like a, I guess some of them you can do measurements, uh, sort of brainstem measurements. Then you have to sort of anesthetize the animal, and eat, to do measurements like that, or you have to train them. I guess some animals are more trainable than others to to get a response. Uh, something like a monkey, you know, sort of, um, or, or birds might be. You might be able to train them to to give a, a conditioned response when you're playing a signal at different levels. But uh, other species, that might not be the case. So it's, it's kind of challenging in that way. I'm going to recommend you pop that one into our acoustic monitoring group. Uh, it might be one to pick up in detail in the community. Um, Talia just dropped a link to the acoustic monitoring group on Wild Labs.